Wow, oh, diverse group here. That's pretty cool. Um, lots of uh, various levels of experience and learning. My name is Jim Perry. I've been in the business since 1989. I started out in, in Pine Village. My very first deal, as I was telling Janelle, was a 1031 exchange for a avocado grove in Temecula for a Lake Tahoe condo. <laughs> kind of funny. Uh, so I really got excited about doing 1031 exchanges and became the 1031 exchange expert. So if you missed out on getting into a 1031 exchange, you should never do that because you're, you're going to have to pay a lot of taxes. It'll take a ton of time to get back what you lost in your capital gains taxes and your depreciation recapture. There's several other ways that you can save your 1031, but it doesn't have to be just buying property. And if anybody wants to talk about that, uh, later on, if we have time, we can go over that. So I was out in Rock Patch. He owned some property out there. So we were talking about it. And I was, you know, as a gentleman caller, I had my lady friend out there. We were going to go cut a rug at the gold, uh, what's it called? The gold uh, nugget, gold diggers. There you go. Gold diggers bar out there. And so we're there and this, these country bands were playing, singing, and all of a sudden, a whole bunch of motorcycles came out there, and these Hells Angels guys from Minot, North Dakota, came in. And man, there are all these long, gray-haired guys with long beards and young women that were they were hanging out with them. And I went, "What the heck is going on?" And then I realized I'm a lot older than all those guys were. <laughs> but so I got to thinking when I was out there, why do we have opportunity zones? I mean, how did the heck did that happen? Well, if you remember way back 70 years ago, a little less than that, um, 60, when John F. Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. You know, kind of what happened to that? Why do we have to have opportunity zones now? So LBJ got elected. You know, he became the, the president after uh, JFK died, as some of you may recall, and he started the Great Society. What did that do to our society? Well, it made it that family units weren't really all that important and that the government was going to take care of you. So we've kind of gone through that whole process for the last several years, whether it's Republican or Democrat, independent, doesn't really matter. The vast majority of the time in our society, except for maybe Reagan, uh, we've had big government trying to take care of us from cradle to grave. So Trump comes along, some enterprising young MBAs came up with this idea. Let's start investing in areas where underprivileged people are, low income. So an opportunity zone requires the vast majority of them. There's, you know, there's always exceptions. Uh, the opportunity zones require that you're actual income is less than 80% of the median in order to get an investment in there. So these guys decided, okay, there's been a whole bunch of people that have had huge capital gains from stock option sales, mostly. A lot of us real estate investors during that time really didn't make huge money. But so the vast majority of this was from guys from Silicon Valley in New York <laughs> making huge profits and the government didn't want them to have to pay all that money or certain people in the government. That's my personal opinion. And so they created the, the, uh, this act, the tax adjust, I can't remember the name of it. I, oh, here it is. Yeah, Tax Cut and Jobs Act. So let's go ahead and go, go over that in, in 2017. It's not going. Yeah, yeah, just maybe way. just. Yeah, so it's called the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, and that then created these opportunity zones. Believe it or not, they're in all 50 there you states. Go. There you go. It's working. Okay, great. That's not really the slide I wanted, but that's okay. Doesn't matter. We'll go over it. Uh, so there's actually 8,764 different opportunity zone census tracts available in the United States today. They started out for any investments that you could 
go into them as of the end of December 2017. So they've been around quite a while. They're not anything new. But one drawback to these opportunity zones is you need to get into them by the end of this year if you want to take full advantage of all the tax advantages that you can get for them. So let's go over some of that. So they're basically in, in distressed. Huh. They didn't have slide two. It's slide three. Oh, they did? Yeah. Oh, okay. So they went directly to slide three now. Okay. So they're ready to go for distressed communities. And so you have to invest in these distressed communities. It's not for just regular investments. If you want to buy multifamily and make a whole lot of money in them. And uh, so how you get into these is you can invest as an individual or you can invest through your LLC or your corporation or anything like that. So you, um, you have to invest into an opportunity zone fund. Now there's opportunity zone funds that are popping up all over the place. Like a 1031, if you invest as an individual, you have if, and sell a, a property or a stock and, and get a huge profit, you have to invest the gain. Now, you don't like unlike a 1031 exchange, you don't have to invest all of the proceeds, including the debt that you um, paid off or moved into the opportunity zone fund itself. You only have to invest your gain. So let's say you're an enterprising Silicon Valley guy, you got your stock options with Facebook or, or one of the others made a lot of money, you got a million bucks uh, profit. If, you, if it costs you 500,000 to get that million and you got a mil five, you don't have you do not have to invest 500,000 bucks, only the million. If you're an individual, you have to invest within 180 days of when you sold the previous property or stock or whatever you sold, your company, your uh, assets. If you're an LLC or a company, it's different. It's 180 days from the end of the actual date, uh, actual tax year. So if you have a fiscal year, it's 180 days from the end of that fiscal year. So it could be as much as a year later on those investments. Your goal is to defer the taxes on the sale. And so how you defer the taxes is you invest in that opportunity zone fund. And I have some specific statistics here. As of June uh, 2018, there were a total of 8,762 census tracts that allow you to invest in these opportunity zones. Um, most of them are low income. There's a few hundred that, that they allowed, especially in more expensive areas like Manhattan and Los Angeles and certain areas like that, where the income levels never reached below 80% of the, of the median. And there's even some in Puerto Rico. If you wanted to invest your proceeds, you could invest in Puerto Rico. <laughs> Not a good time. Yeah, <laughs> that's for sure. That is for sure. Could be a good deal on some places, though, you know. That's By the way, why. guys, John Spinola was my mentor when I first got into this business in 1989. So I'm uh, I'm thrilled that he's here to listen. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Okay, so here's some uh, more important things that you need to know. Once you've invested into it, you have if you invest for five years and keep that investment, then your basis of what you invested into it it'll go up by 5%. And then if you invest it for seven, it'll go up to actually up to 15%. So your basis on the property that you sold steps up to an additional 15%. So you're actually going to be able to protect uh, more of your capital gain. Now, the drawback on all of this is you only defer the taxes on the capital gains that you brought forward to buy into this investment through December 31st of 2026. So roughly we've got a little over four years to make this happen and still protect that gain if you want to go the opportunity zone fund route. So I don't mean to jump ahead, no, go ahead. later on, um, but it sounds like it's mainly to like defer taxes on a certain amount of gain. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the benefit of 
doing an opportunity zone investment versus like a traditional real estate deal? In my, in my humble opinion, there really isn't one. Okay. Uh, it's more for capital gains uh, from other sales. It's just if you can't find an uh, a, a 1031 exchange because mm. you're getting sub three caps, like this gentleman pointed out earlier, is so true right now, right? Especially in multifamily. Uh, it's uh, you're going to put it into there to at least defer that. So this is like an alternate option to save exactly. that capital gain for a 1031. Yeah, no, but here's the benefit though. If you invest in an opportunity zone fund and you you, you defer all of that tax and step up your base. Everybody understand what step up basis is? You're all familiar with that term? Okay, so if you're not familiar, what that means is you have a cost basis when you purchase a property. You then... Um, when you sell that, you have a you have a, a cost basis that you have to pay capital gains tax on, and it also sets up your depreciable basis, which allows you to depreciate that property. When you sell a property, you have to pay twenty five percent of that of the uh, depreciation that you took on your taxes, which is a gimme money. I mean, it's a kind of a fake deal tax deal that doesn't cost you anything, but it just benefits you. But you got to pay twenty five percent of that back plus the 15% or 20.8, 20, uh, or I'm sorry, 23.8 if you're in the higher tax bracket on, on the recapture. So what, what it does is if you can step up your basis, that means your tax that you're gonna have to pay is, is lower and it can be up to 15% lower because of, of being able to raise the value of your cost basis. It, is that clear? Does everybody understand that? Okay. So once you've done that, then if you keep it for 10 years, here's the benefit to doing an opportunity zone fund. All of the gain that you've achieved over the, all the capital gains that you've achieved over that 10 year period, you don't have to pay the tax on. It's wiped out for investing in. So then you can go ahead and sell it. And you, so a 1031 won't allow you to do that. What a 1031 does is gallops over here and you keep deferring and deferring and deferring until you decide not to or you die. And then your kids get the stepped up raises. Mm -hmm. so, so opportunity zone funds are a benefit to you for that reason. So let's go over the specific details. You defer the gain until the earliest of the sale of the investment. So let's say you sale it before the before the December 31st of 2026 or that date, December 20, December 31st, 2026. Then you have to pay the capital gains taxes that you deferred on the sale of your property and bought into the opportunity zone fund at that point. So once you've paid all of those taxes, everything else you earn on the, uh, including the appreciation on that property, uh, you get to keep, if you keep it for 10 years. If you keep it for five, you get to 10%. If you keep it for seven, you get 15. So you wanna make sure that if you're gonna invest in one of these things, usually it makes sense to keep it for the full 10 years. And I'll tell you, if you're an invest in an opportunity zone, a lot of that, you can make a tremendous amount of money. And why is that? Because when you, now, before I go, before I answer that question, I want to make up one more point. When you buy a property in an opportunity zone, you are required to, let's say you buy it for a million dollars, you have to add or improve it for about as much as amount you invested into that property. So you buy it for a million, you have to put another million into it in order to create that value. <laughs> but if you do that right, you're going to have some significant appreciation over that 10-year period. I'm going to ask, has anybody bought a property and lost money over a 10-year period in, a, in these cyclical economic markets that we've seen? I, I tell you, I, I haven't. I've, I've lost money during that 10-year period. And quite a bit in some sections, in some cases, 
But if you look at every 10 year economic cycle and you hang on to it for that long, you're going to probably have made money on it. And that's before the tax benefits of the depreciation and, and the, uh, the capital gains benefits that you get. So there's a, to re reiterate, there's a partial forgiveness of, of the capital gain of the original investment. This is it's somewhat complicated, so I want to try and make it as simple as possible. It's of that capital gain that you invested. Now, remember, in, a, in an opportunity zone, you do not have to invest the original amount of money that you invested into the property, only the capital gain that you realize. And so you, after five years, you get a basis, step-up basis of 10% additionally, and then uh, forgiveness of additional future gains if you hold it for 10 years. You can make the election to increase the basis for the taxpayer's qualified opportunity fund to the equal fair market value of the, uh, quality, uh, the qualified opportunity zone fund interest when you sell it. So what that means is you pay no tax on the capital gains. So it's definitely worth doing that if you're if you're a buy and hold kind of investor in these distressed areas. I can tell you there are so many good ones that are are quote distressed areas. But I'll tell you the Northern Nevada um, uh, Investment Center and Tall Regional Industrial Center actually have some. Uh, qualified opportunity zone areas that you can invest in and come on that's uh, how is that distressed in my my opinion you know when they bought that stuff uh, started selling it back in 2005 they couldn't give it away and now it's worth billions right so that to me is pretty amazing okay Oh, here, here's some other important rules in here that you have to understand. And I'm hoping we could go to Which the one? next slide. The next one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, this is really, I'm, I'm not even going to waste your time with all this because that's so far over all of our heads. It doesn't really matter. What I want to point out, though, is that property is considered to be substantially improved if you improve it over the next 30 months after you buy it. So that's, you have 30 months plus the 180 days from the time you actually acquire it to improve it and still be able to get the tax benefit of the opportunity zone. So you don't have to do it all in six months like a construction exchange is, you would have to do it in 1031. So there's an additional benefit for qualified opportunity zones. So it, it, is it basically like a incentive to like increase the overall livability of communities? Essentially? That's exactly the goal. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And people who made a lot of money and don't want to pay the huge tax are now going to invest in this area as opposed to a giant office building in Manhattan or a, or a high rise apartment building. Okay. Now, in order to benefit from that 30 month, it has to and substantially improve the property. It has to be 100% of what you originally invested in it. But you don't have to do it all in that 180 days. It'll give you enough time to, to actually get the work done. Whether you want to do multifamily or do a, uh, like, like what you're investing in commercial properties, if you want to do a manufacturing facility or something like that, you're able to uh, take that time to actually get the permits and, and get all the work done. Are you performing a cost segregation to determine the land value versus the improvements? Per, yes, yes. Per basis, uh, you have to double the basis of the land. No, you double the basis of your investment. Yeah, you have to double, you don't have to double the basis of the land, but you have to double the basis of your investment. That's the point, up to 100%. So if I'm putting, if I'm putting a, a, a million in and I want, I have a $500,000 building and I have $500,000 land, I have to put 500 grand into that building. So that's a good point. I, I don't think that's true. The, the, um, on that one, the way to get around that, I, from what I've studied is you buy the land first, 
And then the loan that you take on it, the bank will actually give you credit for the land. So it has your down payment. So it's not actually part of your original investments on it. So that's kind of, I think that's okay. what you're. Like, yeah, my understanding is you, you, um, you don't have to, you have to improve the land. Sure. You have to improve right. it, but that's by putting buildings in. Right. Okay. So you're talking about raw land versus. Yeah. And most people don't buy raw land in opportunity right. zones. They actually buy, sure. but you can. So my, so I could be wrong. My understanding is if you buy an existing structure that's already, or a piece of land that has been, so that's been kind of improved, right? Right. You can do a, you can do an, a, you only have to double the basis of the improvements. That's, I could be wrong. But my understanding from what I, from, Oh, one, one that I'm investing yeah, in in, in Sierra Springs Opportunity Zone yeah. Fund, and I'll go over that with after we go over this um, brief presentation. Is that you have to put 100 percent of your investment to improve the property? John, do you have a different view? No. Well, you can. The other thing you can do is buy land if you got your act together and put a building on it. Right. It's so you can right. actually in, build in that case you have to spend at least the amount that you spent on the land. In order to double whatever, it. but if you buy it, yeah, anyway, it's fine. I'll okay. it well, if you buy it with the building on it, then it's the same same thing. You got to improve the building, you got to improve the building, but not the land. Is my that, yeah, well, that improves the value of the land. Mm -hmm. yeah, whatever right. you put in, you got to you got to add that much capital. Yeah, that's my yeah. understanding, too. So, you know, you can, you can buy raw land, but you've got to put in the infrastructure, the sewer, the utilities, and, and all of that. Yeah. So one other thing I want to point out real quick right here is it can't be a sin business. And a sin business is a golf course, really? <laughs> okay, you can't invest in a golf course. Sorry, guys. All you golfers out there won't work. Can't invest in something that sells alcohol at retail. So you can't buy a C store and fix that up and sell all the booze. And you can't buy it, you can't do it with a casino either. So that's kind of a, one of the few things that you can invest in. Question, is this just for commercial property or can it be for residential? It can be for residential rentals, but not for your own single family home. So you could theoretically buy a, a developed lot and build the building from the, the resident oh, yeah. on it and then rent it out. Sure, then, absolutely, yes. And I believe there is also an exemption for the single family investment that you buy if it has not been depreciated by the previous owner. Yes, I have heard yeah, that. Yeah, you don't have to double. And that's the cool thing. Okay, we go to the next, next step. Next slide. Okay, here's another benefit, but we have to take care of it right away if we're going to invest. We have to do it by the end of this year, and that is 100% expensing using a, a 179 expense. Now, this is more for guys that are buying plants and equipment to run their business and do a manufacturing in a qualified opportunity zone. You can section 179 expense otherwise depreciable assets that are less than 20 years of uh, life so that's um, big cranes trucks anything that isn't real property and so but it has to be in place in service uh, by the end of this year otherwise then they every year after that they lower that benefit by 20 percent and the other important thing on that is the the law that that uh, came into effect at the end of 2017 said that you could section 179 expense depreciable asset depreciable property that you acquire in your business or or enterprise from 500 grand to a million and then the phase out amount of that the 20 percent down over the next five years is up to two and a half million. so the 179 expense you can expense everything that you've invested in the first year right 100 percent of it up to a million bucks and that's that's all your improvements so that's a, that's a pretty good benefit if you if you have a a lucrative business and you're creating a lot of income it really shelters a ton of that 
that income. Doesn't that affect like HVAC, electrical, yeah. and, and water heating? Absolutely. That's my understanding. Like within a building, if you improve those systems. Right. Because those are all personal uh, property. Basically. Yeah, they're all personal property that uh, you're using in your in your um, development, and you can definitely do that. Okay, the next. Um, here's here's the difference. Go to the next slide. The difference between. Yeah, the next. Yeah. The difference between 1031s and opportunity zone funds. And like I said earlier, in a 1031, you have to actually invest all the proceeds. And that includes what your basis was because you're trying to uh, defer all of that uh, into the future. With the opportunity zone fund, you only have to invest the gains. Now, the within the 180 days for both, that's for individual investors. If you are a, an LLC or a corporation, you have you actually have a little bit different time frame. You can go to the end of your fiscal year or the end of your tax year. And then, of course, you can defer your capital gains indefinitely as long as you continue to do the 1031 exchange. But what if you don't want to do a 1031 exchange anymore? If you go the, the qualified opportunity zone fund route, then that, like I said earlier, you don't pay any tax on any of that gain that you've made over that 10 year period. There are other ways that you can protect yourself from if you want to get out of a 1031 exchange with Delaware statutory trust and deferred sales trust. So it's not, you know, it's not the end of the world if you don't want to do a 1031 exchange, but that's another another discussion for another time. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, 45 day window difference? No. Nope. Like 180 to, days. Huh? 180 days. So the 45 day doesn't apply? Only with a 1031 exchange. Great question. What was right. it? His question was, do you have to identify the property that you want to buy in the qualified opportunity zone fund in 45 days like you do with the 1031 exchange? And you don't. You have 180 days to do it. Not, not to be a smart ass, but that step up in basis is <clears throat> that's no longer valid. That because the realization date is 1231 12, 12, 26, 22. and yeah. you can't, it's impossible to hold for five years well, until 1230. It's, I'm sure of this. No, it, it actually, I, I asked that exact question of the experts who actually um, did this, and yeah. said you can be on that, you have to pay your capital gains tax, right. At the end of 2026, you have to pay that, but you can still get the basis stepped up as long as you hold it for five years, whether it's 1226 or not. If you invest today, right, you invest today in that and you hold it for five years, you still get the 10% step up in basis. That you just have to pay in tax on the capital gain you gain between now, now and 26. Correct. Oh, okay. but you're saying, but if you hold for 10 years, you get. 100% step up right. basis. So you're saying if you hold for five years, you get 10% step up Correct. basis. And seven, you get 50. Got it. So if you decide, that's only relevant if you decide to sell before 10. Exactly. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I Next slide. I was going to go over all of this, but it's it doesn't really show the true real benefit if you have a capital gain and you're in the 20% uh, bracket, you have to pay the tax. Uh, and if you don't invest, your actual after-tax net return is about 20, 12%. Go to the next one. So if you go into an opportunity zone fund, but don't take advantage of the full year, uh, full 10-year benefit, then your after-tax net return is going to be about 50, 15 percent because you get the you get the fifteen percent stepped-up basis after a period of time. If you go the full amount of time and see, so you can look at the five years and the right. seven year yeah. there. Okay, and then uh, if you go and keep it for the full amount of time, mm -hmm. instead of only getting a twelve percent um, return on your investment on a fully taxed, you get 23%. So there's a benefit to you. And that's 11% more money that you can invest rather than have to get just to get that back to even if you had a fully taxable 
Oh, and this is the okay. it's like a twenty three percent on an average of ten years, correct? Yeah, it's with not a, like a with 20, a minor, with a ten percent appreciation. Yeah, it's not like a twenty three percent averaged out annually. It's that's the that's whole. Total, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, it, it's a it's a it's a twenty three percent average annual return on your investment. Right. But you don't get uh, you don't get the full hundred percent like you would on on a ten thirty one. The, the the real benefit with this is if you don't have a ton of money to uh, invest in real estate, and but you've made money in the stock market. Of course, I don't think any of us made the money in the stock market in the last six or eight months. I know I haven't. That's pretty dumb on my part. But but uh, you're over the long haul. The real estate's great, but all these guys that had the stock options and made a ton of money, maybe selling their their uh, corporate assets, um, they're going to have to pay a super ridiculous amount of tax, especially if they owned it as an S corp or a or an LLC. Uh, as you all know, C corps have to pay thirty five percent tax on their gains. So I hope nobody's doing a C corp in here. Okay, so. Are there any other any questions about the basics of opportunity zone funds? I know I was clear as mud. I tried to kind of make it as simple as possible on a very complicated subject. Are you prevented from doing a cash out refi halfway through it? No. You can cash out refi. Do whatever you want. Hang on 10 years, everything else. I, I think on that one, there's a two year situation. Well, yeah, in the, in the initial, but yeah, yeah it's, it's like any. And, and the reason he's bringing that up is because if you sell, if you sell like a, a 1031 exchange, you have to go over two tax or two tax seasons in order to get the benefits. So if you sell this, if I don't think it's two years, I think it's two tax seasons. Okay, so it it could be as short as 13 months. So you're right, though. It's it's an average CPA is going to tell you, you know what, guys, you should hold it two years before you cash out refund. You know, because even if it's two tax seasons, then it, it's most, it avoids the speculation of like looking at it. Yes, it's two different calendar years technically, but it, like you said, it could be 13 months. And then that's where you get people looking at you like, all right, what are you doing? Because it's not the full 20 or In my past experience, I, I don't think the IRS is going to audit you if you, no. if you go through two tax returns. Okay. That's the point on, yeah. on your either your 1031 exchange or your opportunity zone fund. Can we go to the Sierra Springs Opportunity Zone yeah. fund? Okay, I thought I had that up here too. Dot gun. It'll take me a second to find it. Uh, there we go. Is that Silver Springs? Yeah. Isn't that a pretty picture? Ooh. That ain't real, but you know the bridge is. Right? <laughs> 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 so anybody else see the bridge is kind of look like that. This works now too. The things right here, it works. Now. All right. So there was a this thing started. This thing came out around 2019. It's in our local community. It's down in Silver Springs, which is about 15 miles south of. Uh, Fernley, and where the roundabout is at the uh, Tall Reno Industrial Center, where the USA Parkway comes down, it starts about maybe a mile to the east of that, and then everything south. And I'll go over, I'll show you on the map what it is. So, and it is near Lake Lahontan. I hate to tell you, but there's no water in Lake Lahontan today, but it looked like that a while ago. <laughs> We're thinking, we haven't realized this yet, but we're thinking we're going to see an, an annualized 35% return on this Opportunity Zone fund invested in this area. Now, the guys that did Tall Reno Industrial Center are now moving over to the Northern Nevada Industrial Center are actually making even larger investments than that. But this particular one, George Peak, anybody know him in town yet? Yeah. George Peak uh, owns the uh, water company down in Silver Springs. And he owns all the water there. 
bunch of California developers came in here and bought up all that land down there. And some of them even had junior water rights. Junior water right won't do anything for you in an in investment if you can't get the senior water rights to be able to develop. So they ended up losing their shirts and selling all of their land uh, along with the junior water rights to this opportunity zone fund. Is 35% uh, pre-tax, do I get a K-1? If yes. there's an operating entity producing income and there's a depreciating asset, do I get a the depreciation schedule? Yeah, you're you're actually you're actually a shareholder in this, so you will get a K-1. If you invest in this opportunity zone fund, you're a, you own shares of stock. Uh, in in the company that owns it in this opportunity zone fund, you're buying into the fund, and so you're getting the benefit of all of the development that's going on in here. So does that apply to you were saying like if you invest a million, you got to put a million into the uh, improvement? Does that because you're buying a percentage of the fund when you buy land in this fund, right? Um, is the million that goes into improvement aggregated from everybody buying into the fund, or is it you still have to put in that million yourself? I love that question. Did everybody understand that? If I buy into this fund, do I have to, and take my initial investment, do I have to double that in order for the fund? No, because the fund does that for you. You're buying shares of stock in it, and the fund actually will do that for you. Okay, so all the improvements that everybody who's in the fund does applies to that second. It's in the aggregate, yeah. Okay, cool. So, so one of the real benefits to this is investing in this thing. There is over $470 million in grants and low interest loans that the state of Nevada is trying to basically give away to get these things going, get these things uh, invested in. So not only are you getting in on a ground floor if you can invest in this thing, but you also... Uh, are able to take advantage of the, not you personally, but the fund to develop it and generate those kinds of returns because they're they're getting either grants or very, very low interest. Okay. The real benefit to this also is the Opportunity Zone Fund has an option on all of George Peak's water company, all of the senior water rights in the entire basin, as well as the junior water rights. They've also, they also have a 50-year lease on the uh, airport down there, and it can be expanded up to 9,000 feet. And at our altitude, 9,000 feet will take the, uh, the biggest jet that any of the commercial airlines will run. The higher the elevation, obviously, the longer uh, because of the air, you know, there's a bunch of physics in it, but suffice it to say, they can expand this. It's currently at 6,000 feet. They can expand it up to 9,000 at the airport. The very interesting thing about this is if you, if you do any improvements to that airport, the little old lady that owns it will extend the lease uh, up to, you know, so that it stays at 50 years and keeps on going. So let's say there's 48 years left on the lease. We expand the air, the runway. It's, uh, it goes another two years. So it'll always be a 50 year lease on that property. So it basically, as many of you know, if you own a property or you own a lease on a property for 30 years, that's considered real property and you can do the depreciation. So 30 plus. Yeah, and this is what I'm talking about on the whoop, <laughs> so, on the uh, um, federal and state funding. And everybody knows, you know, this is, we all know that. That's why we came to Nevada to invest. Okay, so see the little airplane down there? I know it's a, a small picture, but everyone is going to get a copy of this, so you can look at it once you, um, once you leave here tonight. It'll be emailed to all of you if you give. Do they all have emails? Yeah, please make sure you put your email yeah, on there. Yeah, the tablet should be passed. Would everybody have a chance to? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So you'll notice the trick to the Paul Reno Industrial Center is up to the northwest of that, and that green line is the USA Parkway. So it comes down everything below the airport along this area down here. All of this is part of the Sierra Springs Opportunity Zone Fund. And so there's going to be a mixture of various types of investments. They're planning golf courses in their uh, apartment complexes, manufacturing. A lot of this is going to be green manufacturing because you get significant tax benefits, but good green manufacturing, not just the tax advantage green manufacturing that doesn't survive without the, the uh, tax benefits. And we all know what those are, wind and solar. <coughs> wind and solar. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're going to be manufacturing things like biodegradable bottles. Can you imagine how many plastic bottles that go into the ocean every day and all that will be gone? when you can manufacture biodegradable bottles that will hold not only uh, water, but, but sodas and all other kinds of beverages, and even the bottle caps they figured out are, are uh, biodegradable. But they're going to have several different types of uh, investments in there, and they've already bought one of the manufacturing buildings just below the airport. So, you know, they're stating that it's now positioned to be a second Silicon Valley, and I really believe that it's not just for high tech stuff, but it's for everyday uh, products and manufacturing that we're going to need in order to, to have a sustainable life out here in the desert. And there's plenty of water for all of this growth that they're going to have on this 3,000 acres. Um, I'm not going to go into all the specific details of this, but uh, you can read this when you look at the prospectus because everything I'm showing here is going to be on it. Yeah, Bruce, and then I'll get you. So, do you have to have a capital gain from somewhere to invest in the ocean? Well, that's a great question. Bruce asked if you have to have a capital gain in something else in order to invest in this, and you don't. Minimum investment for small investors, if you want to get a taste, is 25000 bucks, and it's a buck 80 a share. This is a company that's going to go public. But the question is if you're going to take advantage of the 10 years, why not stay into it when it's worth billions 10 years from now than selling it, selling the stock when it goes public, unless you really have to? Anyway, that's that's your option. These are the uh, the CEO and the, and the initial developers of this project. Rado de, uh, de Gasparis has uh, started three separate companies, international companies, and taken them all public, so he's got a pretty good track record. Of course, Herb Stein, he's the guy that built our stadium. Uh, no, he wasn't. That was, I was thinking it was him. He was part of that group, right? Herb Stein and uh, the Herb Simon guys. So uh, all of these people have the credentials uh, to be a strong leadership group in <laughs> And then these are some of the, um, these are a couple of the uh, consultants that are part of the program. Okay, let's get into the meat of the, of the information on this. Uh, the airport, it's already 100% owned through the 50-year lease. That's why I say it's owned, because they have anything that's 30 years or more on a lease is considered real property. They've... We've got about 6,500,000 into it now. I've been looking to get uh, a total of a $50 million investment. And at the end of 10 years, we anticipate it's going to be worth over $2.1 billion. So here's all the shares that are offered, and there's the um, current price of the shares. Um, and the day it goes public, this is not one of these Section 1244 dealings that, that uh, you have to hold on to it for a long time before you can sell it. If you really need the money after it goes public and you quintupled your money or whatever it is when it is a public offering, you can sell it that day. You don't have to wait two years and hold on to the stock. These are the projects. Now... When you look at all these projects, and you're probably going to go through these after uh, this presentation on your own time, 
those projects are numbered one through nine, but they don't necessarily have to be in, in uh, built and developed one through nine. They'll be developed when the demand is there. And, you know, there are companies in there that are going to be building houses that'll save at least 30% on current building costs because they have better materials and ones that are, are stronger and less expensive than trying to build with two by fours and framing and cement. So you're actually gonna be able to sell a really nice house in the low 300s. And uh, so that's gonna bring in all of those uh, people who can't afford to live in our community because our prices are where they are. And I'm not saying our prices are gonna be skyrocketing at the moment, but they're not gonna go down to the low 300s again ever. So that's, uh, and that's a goal to get the residential part of that. So there are some residential uh, areas in here, you'll see seven, eight, nine, and they may start those early in order to, to bring in tax revenues to the, to the county. Here's the 50 million in total investment initial, and this is the uses of the, of, uh, the capital here. Okay, so this gives you an, an idea of, of the area and where everything is. It's basically, basically down in this area around here, all over this area right here. That's where it is from the region. Now, if you look at Tall Reno Industrial Center and the Northern Nevada Industrial Center, they're pretty much, the Tall Reno Industrial Center is pretty much already developed. There's a few stale facts that are coming back that we recently learned about because they didn't end up using all the land. But the Northern Nevada Industrial Center is the same guys, Roger Norman and, and uh, our buddy that owned the Mustang Ranch, who became a real estate agent. Name slips my mind. What is it? <laughs> Everybody knows him. You all know him, right? Come on, somebody help me here. Lance, uh, um, Lance Gilman. Yeah. Thank he you. He still owns the ranch. Yeah, Lance Gilman. He's a uh, he's the marketing guy. Roger Norman is the money guy. But they've pretty much they're going to be taking this additional 22,000 acres in there and doing similar investments that they did at the Tuttle Regional Industrial Center. Ours is a smaller investment with manu more manufacturing, but an entire community where you're gonna have housing, you're gonna have golf courses, you're going to have manufacturing, you're gonna actually have community centers and um, shopping and uh, businesses. So a lot of small business owners can come in there and uh, create a pretty good life for yourselves. And there it is. Everything below the diagonal is currently what's already going on. So this is a little outdated, but that's what uh, has happened since the, the Opportunity Zone funds began. This particular presentation was originally given in November of 2020. So it's a couple of years old. Busy, busy, busy uh, um, slide here, but everything in blue has already been bought and used, utilized, and they're building. Is everybody familiar with switch and why our area grew so much because of that? Yeah, they started, they, they built this 1 million square foot building with a bunch of computers in it from prepaid uh, computer capacity with that. So they didn't borrow any money. They did it all with, with prepaid. They're starting the second one um, pretty soon. I think the beginning of the year. Yeah from prepaid. I always wonder why they call it a cloud when they bury it in the ground. Yeah. <laughs> so, but here's the interesting thing about it. You think that uh, all these people came in because there was one switch um, building? There's going to be 16 of them. In Northern Nevada? In there. 
Yeah. In that industrial park area? Yes. Yeah, I was actually invited to be part of the uh, data center building team. Um, I turned it down because I was renewing my contract in the military, but um, they they invited me to be part of the uh, clean room data center building tech uh, team. And they're, they're, they planned, I think, 17 data center so parks yeah. out there. So, yeah. 16 so. more of them. Yeah. Crazy, huh? And you know what the kind of growth in the next 50 years? Here's my prediction. Reno Sparks will become the bedroom community of Fernley Silver Springs in the next 50 years. Seriously, guys. Seriously, the isn't, opportunities are all down there. Isn't Fernley still having issues with water right now? Um, my mom was living up there and telling me that they're having issues with the water cap right now. I'm not aware. No. But okay. I own a couple of houses in Reno, my or in Fernley, my tenants haven't told me, but huh. I don't know. All I know is there's a lot of water underground. Yes, sir. You, you know the answer? No, I don't know the oh. answer. I, I'm just curious. Uh, I heard, and, and maybe this is well known information, but uh, um, Fallon, uh, the Navy base out there is going to be tripling in size uh, here, I, I think, next five years or something like that. that. Yes, I've heard that too. And I have a couple of clients who are buying houses. They're going to be there for three years. And they told me, I want to buy a new house and live in it because I want to turn it into a rental for the military families that are coming after me. And they're already thinking very yeah, clearly. They're, I think they're uh, stationing another wing there. Yeah. Yep. So that is huge as well. But quality of life in a community, Fallon's kind of a, a set area. And uh, down there, everything's going to be brand new. So it, it just depends on, on where you want to be. I think the investment potential in the Silver Springs area, because it is a, a very strong opportunity zone fund with the state and federal government saying, we really want to help this place grow. Mm -hmm. So is in there their, any concern with some of the environmental issues there in Silver Springs? We go from mining or, or what? You, on on radio active materials on the ground for them. I'm not aware. I'll, but you know if that's important, if you all want to know that, I'll find out. Because uh, Corrado's, you know, he owns the Comstock mine up in Virginia City. So he would know if there are environmental problems. I don't think so, but I'll find out for sure and get back to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we talked about switch, Tesla, you know all about all this, Google's uh facility, not only the building of Google, but all of the thousands of acres they bought to, to do the uh, auto-driven cars, the whatever you call them, no drivers. Okay, the rest of this stuff uh, you can look at. I just want to give a brief overview about the about what it is and how it's available. If you have any questions, my my cell phone number is 775-287-6818. And you can get a hold of me at jim.perry, P is in Papa E R R Y at C B select re.com. And I'm happy to answer any questions or go over specific details on this. And full uh, disclosure, I am an investor in this. Yes, my phone number is 775-287-6818. And I think my information is on the introduction page, right? That's all that strange stuff. Yeah, you already we went through all of that uh, the, the basics on the opportunities on funds. So you get that. My recommendation is if anyone's interested in doing this or investing in it, it's uh, it's a long term project. It's something that's going to make a whole bunch of money over a long period of time. Um, you'll make good short term money if you only stay in a few years. But this is really more something that I wanted. I invested in because I want my grandkids to be rich and not have to worry about it. Yeah. For the investment, um, if you go in as an investor, 
Uh, is it set up as a K one? You're part of the yeah. Okay. You yes. You get it at ten sixty five. You get a K one. And then um, are the payouts on that are those uh, set up quarterly? Um, or most of the proceeds are going back into the project for the first couple of years. It'll all be reinvested, but once it goes public, you can take your money out anytime you want. Is there a projected date uh, in, on the scopes for it to go public? Or what is the project uh, timeline for it staying uh, private? Full disclosure, we've been delayed because we haven't gotten the funding we anticipated. Okay. So uh, we thought we would be going public by, by this time next year. I don't think that's going to happen. But I think it'll be within a couple of years. The project development got delayed. Okay, yeah. fine. Thank you. And th a lot of things happened. COVID, uh, you know, material, the supply chain issues, a lot of dumb stuff that we didn't anticipate. I don't think anybody did. I remember when I got COVID in December of 2019, I never thought that uh, that was a thing. <laughs> was... Do you know why they built the new hangar out there? Yes, um, because Elon Musk, mostly and Jeff Bezos, what they're doing there is they're creating a place where they can repair their jets in there. And that's why that was built specifically. But they're planning to do a dozen others, a dozen more, and, and expand the runway so even bigger jets. At this time, they're not planning to do any commercial jets. It's strictly private jets for businessmen. But who knows, you know, maybe sometime in the future, if there's enough demand, uh, it won't just be private jets. That's something like the uh, Cameron Park Air uh, Executive Air maybe, yeah. Are you familiar with that? Yes. yes. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, when is the fund expecting to break ground on development? They already are. They're already doing, they, they have water rights and they've already uh, broken ground on, on one manufacturing plant and they've already got a, a contractor, a manufacturer in one of the ones that's existing. What about the infrastructure side for that city area you're wanting to have all this home there? As soon as we get the, the first 18 million we're doing, we're starting all the projects that we can do. do. Yeah, and we've got from potential tenants or buyers. Yeah, oh, yeah, everybody is interested as uh, to either go and bring their business in. We've got a whole a ton of interest. We just don't have the funds yet to do all the infrastructure. That's our that's our main drawback right now. But personally, as a small investor, I would like to see small investors get involved in this and. And have a you know be able to build a, a uh, legacy. Uh, we've got a couple of guys that want to come in with twelve to twenty million, and then run the show. And we really would prefer not to do this because I, I selfishly I like the group that is running it right now. They're very capable. Uh, they're just not the world's greatest marketers. And I'm not a big marketing guy. I'm just wanting to let everybody know that this is available and it's something that's going to be good for our community. Yes, sir. So two questions. Um, how does it work for foreign investors? Can foreign investors get in on, on this, the stock option? I don't believe you have to be a citizen to invest in this opportunity zone. Okay. Second question. Have you had institutional investors ask to invest in this, like the 12 million, and have they been turned down? Or what's like the... We, we have one guy that's invested a, a few million, an institutional investor, okay. not just one guy, but one corporation. Yeah. Um, and we didn't turn them down. We were thrilled to have their, their funds. Okay. Um, so we are soliciting a couple of major uh, institutional investors right now, just because it's taken a little longer than we had anticipated to get it off the ground. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'm curious about going back to the other opportunities that are more intermediate. Um, so what happens, you know, they improve the building, they displace the people that were living there, who was probably low income, now the rents are higher. So how does that economy and community work? You know, it's that gentrifying. Well, uh, I love that question because they're not, that's not the goal. What they're trying to do is be able to invest in there, not necessarily raise rents, 
but allow more affordable housing. And that's part of the program in all of these places. Okay. There, there are big cities where there's blight and there they may not be cost effective, but this particular one and the ones in Reno, if you look in the areas downtown Reno, they're, uh, they're buying up dilapidated warehousing and fixing them up, adding more affordable housing in there. So the goal is to help people be able to afford to live in those communities, not, not to put in high-end tenants. Okay. No, that's a great question. Anything else? Yes. Kind of the same question as that, but like, I'm curious on the, the neighborhood side of things there too. I, if I was looking at the map right, like why, whoever's going to build that, why would they, even if their costs are 30% less, why would they sell the houses for $300,000 when a double wide on Citrus Avenue sells for $300,000? It makes no sense. Because they've got, it's instead of having a 4.77 acre lot, you've got a, a 0.15 acre lot and you've got more density, I think is what you're, what you're alluding to. I guess, but I mean, there's already stick built neighborhoods right there, or there's a couple of small ones. Yeah, the the Indians own um, that whole section between um, uh, what's the diagonal? Fifty or Gramsci Weeks, Weeks, yeah, yeah. and and uh, um, Highway Fifty. It just seems like it would be worth much more on day one than three hundred thousand a piece. Even with a smaller lot. But it could be the way they're doing it if it's kind of a manufactured or modular type of building. Yeah, it's a modular, it's it's modular yeah, construction. It's modular. And the goal is to bring in affordable housing so more and more people can afford houses. That's that's the biggest part of the residential aspect. They're doing apartments that are going to be, you know, that they can build at a lower cost and have people be able to afford to come in there and live there as renters. Yeah, this isn't just a a huge profit making thing where you're going to sell a house for 500 grand. They don't want to do that. It helps the employers too. The, the, employee housing. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. So you, it's basically like the affordable housing for people that you want to come in and work at these plants that are yeah. being built. Yeah. Cause you're going to have all kinds of um, jobs. Yeah. It's going to be a job creating machine. Yeah. And they need a place to live. Why not live in your community? Right. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I, I saw the, a little blurb, something about sustainability. Are they using like geothermal or solar for to power to use for electricity and things? Are they using those no, technology? I don't believe we have any geothermal now. We okay. might, but I'm not aware. Okay. But the where the sustainability part comes in is they're going to be using a lot of green manufacturing and they're using materials that are less they're less environmentally sensitive than current products. That's where that comes in. That's the important part of this. And it's all good stuff. I mean, it's yeah. it's not, um, they're not gonna have pollution and they, they had a, a battery recycling company try to come in there and they moved them up to Northern Nevada Industrial Center because they didn't want them recycling the lithium and polluting the, the ground down there. So it's, it's gonna be a, an environmentally, uh, sustainable uh, activity down there for pretty much everything. It's not an ESG deal thing, you know? I mean, uh, we're not trying to, to uh, get tax benefits to do stuff that doesn't make economic sense. That is absolutely not the purpose. Which yeah, solar is actually a dying market. Well, I gotta tell you, I my girlfriend's from Crescent City, and Governor Newsom just signed a thing to take, and it's a beautiful coast on the Northern California coast. And they're going to put a whole bunch of windmills out there in the bay, out in the ocean, and then uh, an energy generation station and where all the elk are living. And where's the where's the the environmentally sensitive aspect of that? They don't care. Yeah, it's it's a, just because um because I actually was part of a solar company that sold solar. Um, not too long ago, and it's because Envy Energy decided to take out a $5.6 billion loan, something like that, to try and get all of 50% of all of Nevada on renewable energy by 2030. So they gave themselves eight years to do it, 
And that's why if you own a house out here, you've seen your energy rate go up like 8% per month because they're trying, they're jacking up the rates to try and pay back that loan, um, which is what allowed the solar company I work for to come in and do um, 100% offset on your bill. So you basically replace your energy bill with financing for the solar panels. But the reason solar is a dying market is because once the solar panels are on the house, they're on the house. You can't take them off really. And two is because it's really not an environmentally sustainable product because if you think about it, yes, it's less impactful on the environment once it's built and on and functioning, but to build the panel, you're actually um, strip mining lithium. So it's actually more damaging to the environment than fossil fuels, if you look at it in the long term. Wow. I agree 100 percent. You're right. And I I wasn't going to get into any politically uh, sensitive discussions on that, but I agree. <laughs> okay, that's uh that's basically um what I have. If you have any questions, I'll stick around for a while and, and be happy to talk to anybody. Other than that, I look forward to seeing you all around. And if you have any 1031. Question. That's what I've been doing for the past 33 years. So that's my real area of expertise. Still learning this. <laughs> Thanks, guys.